How to achieve a high sugar crystal quality of the Messi Cute. Welcome everybody to today's webinar. And now I'm giving up to our today's um, today's presenter, Hans Kramer, who is joining today from America. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Hendrik. My name is Hans Kramer. Uh, I've been in BMA around uh, 11 years now. Don't uh, and uh, before. I, when I started BMA, I was in the engineering department and afterwards I moved uh, to sales where I have, am now uh, the sales manager for the Latin American region and uh, Florida. So uh, we're going to talk today. I'm going to share now my screen um, our topic for today is the BMA process for the seed mass liquid production in what we call the pan seeding system or what we call in Spanish in Spanish uh, the El Tachito. Um, so for crystallization um, it is desirable to produce crystals with a uniform size and appearance uh, with a low uh, variation coefficient or CV and uh, without agglomerations in the end after drying. So in order to, first of all, facilitate the centrifugation and washing in, in the centrifugal station to, to enable the drying without losses, that means uh, uh, to reduce the, the dust uh, in the drying uh, system and to reduce the wash water application and energy consumption and to optimize the crystallization time. And last but not least, to facilitate the storage and the packaging. So in the current situation where we, especially in the cane industry, the seed massacre is uh, produced only by evaporation and uh, in the separate batch pan. That means that uh, they use one batch pan for seed massacre by evaporation and the rest of the batch pans are the ones that are taking care of the crystallization. That means uh, with what we had investigated was uh, there is a lot of local supersaturation peaks, it means the formation of the dreaded fine crystals. So um, due to this the current situation that was also before in the bead industry in the refinery, um, the we in BMA, the without the, the ideal crystallization process, uh, we'd have to look. First of all, it would not have to look um, by first formation of fine crystals, and uh, with a high variation coefficient. These are what the ideal process should not look like. What it should look like is actually uh, to first of all reduce the formation of fine crystals, to have a, a very low variation coefficient and to let uh, a natural growth of the existing crystals. So we in BMA, uh, first in the bead industry, uh, we came out with a solution to separate uh, the seeding from the pan boiling process in a system that is exclusively designed for crystal growth uh, in a well-controlled crystallization process by cooling. Uh, by cooling, we have a, a controlled supersaturation right after seeding and in the end, the results are that we have a more uniform and controlled crystal growth. So, how, how do we do that? As a process description, we can see here in this graph, uh, which uh, in the 
y-axis, we have the temperature and the crystal content, and in the x-axis, we have the time. Um, so in this graph, we have the crystallization without evaporation. So what we do is we start after after letting the, the, the mass liquid inside boil uh, to get to, to a boiling point, uh, we let it cool. We start cooling until we get to the point of the seating point. This is where we add the slurry around 60 degrees Celsius. And after that, we let the, the mass liquid even cool even lower up to 30 degrees Celsius. And by doing that, the crystal content inside uh, grows exponentially. So by the end, we have a temperature of around 30 degrees Celsius and a crystal content of around 20% just uh, with this cooling process. And as you can see, the cooling, the cooling, the temperature of the cooling water is almost uh, around the same uh, or in parallel to the temperature of the mass equipment. So both of them are always running in parallel. So how, how do we, how does it look like really in a, in a process in, the, in our equipment, which is called the Tachito? The, the functional principle is, this is itself the, the, the Tachito or the cooling crystallizer. Inside what we do is, like I told you first, we need to, to evaporate a little bit until the boiling point of the mass liquid. And so we first fill it up. Then we start with the evaporation using the same cooling, using the same coils. And then afterwards, we start cooling down and to the point of seeding, we add the slurry. And we start uh, with the with the mixing since the beginning, and this is what it looks like until it gets to the ideal temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, please keep in mind this is a batch process uh, that it goes around five to six hours per batch. And uh, afterwards, we go to the, uh, the process integration. Um, this is the part where we had to, to think, okay, are we going to integrate the, the cooling crystallizer to a, to a normal system, crystallization system? So here we have the cooling crystallizer. Uh, after a batch, of uh, of seed, what it does is we uh, transport it to a receiver or a malaxator where it keeps uh, turning with an agitator so that it doesn't uh, start also to crystallize. So it keeps moving in the receiver and the receiver then it pumps the seed mass secret to the vacuum pans. And uh, it works also as a type of ring pipeline in which it comes back to the receiver. So uh, after, again, after the cooling crystallizer done, is done with the, with the batch, it goes into a receiver and then it pumps to a vacuum pan or vacuum pans, depending on, on your system. And on the other side, we can see the accessories that we have for the for the cooling crystallizer. First, it's uh, the slurry that comes from, from a slurry mill. Um, we have the, the heat exchanger, which uh, it's a cooling and, and heating heat, heat exchanger. Uh, we have uh, also fresh water steam, vapor, and thick juice. These are all the, the, the elements for the process integration. After that, we have a, another example of a process integration into crystallization using vacuum pans, a continuous vacuum pans, in which, like I told you, this is the first step, uh, the first seed mass production. 
which the slurry, slurry which comes around 10 microns, it goes into the, the cooling crystallizer. And then in the end, we have around 100 to 140 microns. So this is the first step. Afterwards, it goes to the second step, which is in the, in the batch pan uh, that is used always in the continuous process where it can grow the seed that is coming from 100 to 140 microns to around 400 to 500 microns. And then afterwards in the VKT, our solution for continuous uh, uh, vacuum pan, uh, we can have a product a crystal product of around 700 uh, uh, microns, depending on um, on the solution or the, the crystal size that the customer has. So the idea behind the, the cooling crystallizer is that uh, you can you can choose uh, what type of crystal size and uh, content you would like in the end. So think about this as uh, your your pre order of what you want afterwards in the end. So with the cooling crystallizer as a as a system in your in your fa uh, factory, you will get uh, this will be your first uh, phase before you go into into your last phase of crystallization. So for this we have. Um, a design of the cooling crystallizer, depending, we have a wide range of different sizes. It usually is depending on, on the volume and uh, the cooling surface, but um, this, the normally in the, especially in the, in the cane industry, uh, we have that this, this type of cooling crystallizer, the 6.8 is one of the, the most used we say depending on the size of the, of the factory. And in the inside, or, or how it looks like, is we in BMA, we have an individual process that we designed tailor-made to the customer needs. Uh, so the sizes depend mostly on the, the production of, of, of the crystals and sugar in the factory. And inside we have the, the, the uh, seeding crystal is very simple. It is a, it's a, mind you, a tank with a motor inside, uh, outside. Uh, we have an inlet of cold water steam. We have the cooling coils inside. We have the agitator, which in this case is um, part of the, the, the most, uh, important part of the cooling crystallizer. Uh, we have the thick juice entry and the discharge. It is used for crystallization of refined sugar, raw sugar, and white sugar. And uh, it, is a, it is a standard in the, in the refinery and in the bead industry. And um, we just, started to do this uh, as, a, as a product in the cane industry. The reason is um, most of the, the sugar in the beet and in the refineries are sugar that is supposed to be, or that is for uh, direct consumption. And uh, most of the times in the cane industry before, it was only thought of uh, as raw sugar, which was going to be used afterwards in a refinery or for um, afterwards in local consumption. So it was not um, taken into consideration the, a lot, let's put it this way, the, the crystal size, uh, the crystal content, the, um, the, the way it looks. So uh, before in the cane industry, this was not was not used, and uh, now in the in the new age that we have in, in the cane industry, where we have a lot of types of crystal size, 
and uh, the color and the quality. And then uh, this, uh, this product is uh, used mainly, uh, will be used uh, more and more uh, until we have a standard like in the refinery and the bead industry. So um, in the process integration in the cane industry, uh, the current uh, process is the double magma scheme, where we have the slurry coming from the sea mass. The sugar of the sea is basically the seed of the B mass. And the sugar of B is the seed for A. And then the syrup for A goes into, the, into B, the syrup of B goes into C and so on. So uh, the idea, the first time we used the, uh, the cooling crystallizer, the Tachito, was with our, um, the factory in Honduras called Santa Matilde. Um, the idea first was um, we wanted to, to talk about a, a VKT or continuous vacuum pen. And uh, we took, um, we had a, a visit from them to, to Germany to visit some sugar factories. And uh, all of the sugar factories in the bead industry, especially in Germany, have the cooling crystallizer. And uh, every time we, we made a visit with them, uh, they always asked, asked us, what is this? What is this uh, process? What is this equipment? So we told them, yeah, it's uh, the seeding system. And we tried to explain. And uh, uh, we got to the point where Santa Matilde was so interested in this that we had to, let's say, uh, recover this product as uh, this product was, as I told you, a standard of the bead in the, in the refinery industry, but uh, it has it has it was never been used before in the cane industry. So what we did uh, with them was a total different uh, process integration as a, the double magma scheme that usually the cane industry is the uh, the standard and. So this was the example that we used in the beginning. So the seed was going to be separate with the, with the tachito, and it was going to give seed for the A and to the refinery. And then uh, what it was afterwards, the, the, the process was like this. So the seed was going to A, and then the syrup was going to, to, to the B mass. And then the, the B, the same going to the, C, uh, to the C magma. And the only difference was that the sugar of the C was, was going to be the, the seed of B. But the sugar of B was dissolved and used also in the, in the A mass um, instead of, of being the, the seed. So this was the only difference, and uh, the results, which we're going to show you afterwards, was um, really impressive. And uh, we came to the conclusion that, especially in the cane industry, this was going to be uh, this can be a really uh, incredible product, so to speak. So in Santa Matilde, this is uh, what we used. Uh, they had a mass creep production of 150 tons per hour. Uh, the first seed uh, production of the of this cooling crystallizer was uh, 1.6 ton per hour. Um, the volume, as I told you before, 6.8 cubic meters. A cooling surface of 27, and uh, with an agitator of 18 kilowatts and the auxiliary equipment of the feed solution tank and the slurry mill. Now below, below the, the cooling crystallizer is the, the malaxator, 
which, uh, like I told you, is a tank which has inside an agitator, and the auxiliary equipment is the seed, the, the seed massacre pump, and of course the slurry mill, which uh, is only a 10 liter volume, which is a little agitator of 0.5, 55 kilowatts, and the auxiliary equipment of the roller blocks. So this was all the, the equipment that we used for the uh, for the tachito or the cooling crystallizer in uh, in Santa Matilde. And now for the crystallization results that, that we had, especially in the refinery. Uh, this was the first uh, the slurry coming from from the slurry mill. Then this uh, was seen at the end of the cooling crystallization. And then uh, this is the, the refined end product with cooling crystallizer and pan automation. So um, one of the key issues here is, uh, of course, the, the automation of the, of the batch pans as the cooling crystallizer works as a clockwork with the automation of the batch pens either in the refinery or in the AMS. So, uh, the crystallization results, so the, we, they had a crystal growth from 10 microns to 100 microns in the cooling crystallization with a crystal content of 20%. They improved the sugar quality, the particle size, uh, from a coefficient var variation of 44 to 28%. And this is where it's uh, very incredible to see. They had an increase of the capacity of the refinery by approximately 50%. So they used to do 7,000 bags per day previously. And after the 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 use of the cooling crystallizer and the automation of the batch pens, they had a capacity of 11,500 bags a day. Oh. Keeping in mind that this was uh, 50 kilograms per bag. And last but not least, this was the increased sugar yield of around 2 to 4 percent more. So, the benefits of having a cooling crystallizer in the factory, especially in the sugar cane factory now, um, is we have a reduced wash water quantity in the centrifugals, um, improved sugar color, improved sugar syrup separation in the centrifugals, we reduced the formation of fine crystals, uh, fewer losses in the dryer, that means uh, that there's not going to be too much dust. We have a reduced consumption of water and energy and optimized crystallization time. Uh, this is also done by the, the, the automation of the batch pens. We have an improved process control thanks to the automation of the system and the vacuum pens. Improved storage and packaging. We have a, also a uniform product size and appearance and a low investment cost in relation to the benefits. Uh, this is one of the, the key parts of the cooling crystallizer. And in the end, uh, I think everyone in the, in the sugar industry, you may be beet, refinery, or cane, what you want in the end is this. This is uh, the, the money maker. This is what you want. So after, as I told you before, we had a, a, a standard in the refinery in the, in the beet industry. And one of the last um, cooling crystallizer we did was in Chile, where they have a beet industry. They don't have cane. Uh, it was in 2000. And the next, uh, and the first 
cooling crystallizer in the, in the cane industry was in Honduras, in Santa Matilde. After that, uh, we were in India, in, in the cane power. Then uh, with our friends from El Salvador in Henio Salco. Uh, now we have in, uh, in a new refinery, a mini refinery in Hamilton, in Canada. Uh, we also have now in 2019 in the new mini refinery in the US, the California Sugar Refinery. And uh, last year we saw the last one in a pro project for the US where we cannot still speak about it. But uh, what we want is to know where will our new in 2021 cooling crystallizer will be. We have more than 50 tachitos around the globe. As you can see, we have around 40 in, uh, in Europe from the bead industry. We have five in Asia, five in Africa, and we have now six in the Americas. So uh, we hope that uh, with this presentation, we can uh, have more of these tachitos in, uh, in worldwide. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And uh, Hendrik, you have now the. OK, Hans, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really insightful. And um, as we see already, we have many questions. So I would like to jump directly into the first question. So the question is, is it also possible to use it in B and C? So in B and C Messicute, I guess. Um, yes, um, in a way. Um, we did some tests in, uh, in Santa Matilde in Honduras uh, using, uh, using it in the B and C. Uh, the only issue is that um, the crystal is, is very uh, it's very beautiful, and once you put it in the in the continuous machines, continuous centrifugals, as you know, the process is the the sugar goes to hit a wall, and uh, most of the the crystals. Then, if you have these crystals with this um, beautiful size, and uh, uh, um, so that the form and the quality. It's, uh, it's very nice and once you have that and you hit it to a wall, it kind of ended up destroying a lot of the crystals. And so it can be used, of course, in the B or C, but um, it is recommended only uh, for the A mass or the refinery. Okay, so the next one is really uh, sales related. What is the typical return of investment for such a tachito? Um, the, the return of investment um, can be around uh, one year, um, but it, it depends mainly also on uh, the automation uh, of, the, of the actual batch pens in the factory. So depending on that, you can get a, a return of investment um, faster. If you don't have automation of uh, the batch pens, then it gets a little bit trickier, let's say, because mm. we have to combine both. OK, so the next question is, does the cooling, pricer, cooling crystallizer use any type of bricks or density measurement? And if so, what type of brand? Ah, OK. So the brand is usually depending on uh, on the customer. Uh, we yes, we use a, a bricks measurement in the in the cooling crystallizer, and uh, we usually have our own brand. But we, if the customer wants another type of brand, we use that also. But it must be uh, in 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 parallel or with the same usage as what the ones we use, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is, do you still use a sugar grader after the bots, after implementing such system? 
So I guess uh, they are speaking about after the dryer. Again, can, can... this sugar grader will not be required afterwards. So I guess in terms of the nice uh, crystal distribution, is it still necessary to have a sugar grader after the uh, after the drying plant or not? Well, we still recommend it, but um, it um, if you have that quality of sugar afterwards, uh, it's still good to use it. It's not uh, that no one's going to use it afterwards. No. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. So uh, Norbert Prometica is asking, is the cooling crystallizer an exclusive product of BMA? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we um, we have the, the cooling crystallizer and I don't know if anyone else has it. Um, I have not heard of it. And uh, we may be the only ones who do it. I don't know, so I don't really know. But uh, up until now, at least in the Americas, there is no one that has done this before. Yeah, and at least what you just presented is basically showing everything what BMA is doing exclusively. Exactly. So how long is BMA using this process? Ah. You got me there. Um, well, I think it's around, uh, we started using it around the 80s or 70s. Yeah. Yep. And uh, after that, um, it became uh, like a snowball effect in the in the beer industry and uh, in, the, in the refineries. And after that, we, 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 we kind of stopped in the 2000s. And uh, we started again, basically in 2015 uh, with Santa Matilde. Yeah. Okay, so Renata actually was sending a lot of questions, but I would like to focus on this one. They see problems with the incorporation of DITMA in the syrup in the cooling crystallizer. Without doubt, good agitation helps. But what is your view of using isopropanol versus PEG and slurry to improve good distribution of seed across a batch in cooling crystallization? I think this is more uh, in the, the slurry mill where we use isopropanol, but uh, I mean, we use it in our slurry mill, but not in, uh, I have not heard of using it in uh, in the cooling crystallizer. Okay, the next one. Is the cooling crystallizer limited to 100 to 140 micrometers or can it be grown bigger? If not in the cooling crystallizer, can it be done afterwards in the receiving tank? Uh, 100 to 140 is a range that we see uh, possible the growth of the crystal in the cooling crystallizer. Afterwards, in the malaxator or the receiver, there is no more growth there. Um, the only growth can be done afterwards in the batch pan, um, but this is more the crystallization part. So in the, in the cooling crystallizer, no. Uh, the limit is 140 uh, microns. Okay, so next question comes from Catherine. How do you explain the 50% increase in capacity? I guess they are relating to Santa Matilda. Yeah. Fine reduction or better MA? No, it was actually a very good question. Thanks. Um, this is what they normally do in the cane industry is that they have one batch pan that works exclusively to do the seed. And uh, let's say, for example, they have another three batch pens for the crystallization. So uh, when you separate the, the seeding from this batch pen, you're basically adding one fourth of production to, to, the, to the batch pen crystallizations. So instead of using three, you're going to use four. And now with, with the automation, uh, you're going to also increase uh, uh, the capacity in the in the in the batch pens, and so using this uh, separating the seeding 
and doing the automation in the batch pens, you will increase uh, the, the production or the yield in the in the crystallization for, for A or, or refiner. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hans, here's one question which is quite related to that one. Uh, do we have any experience if it's possible to adopt the system without changing the batch pens to be automated? Um, no, we don't have uh, experience doing this without the automation of the batch pens. We do not recommend it. Uh, we recommend if you're going to use, if you're going to do the this investment, uh, which will bring you like quite a lot of advantages. We recommend doing it uh, with the automation of the batch pens. It will help incredible the usage of the both uh, products, the automation of the batch pens and the, the cooling crystallizer uh, in your end results. And like I said before, the return for investment may be a little bit, not a year, but uh, we're talking about maybe two years at most. So uh, the investment is worth it. Okay, so one additional question. What is meant by batch pen automation? So does BMA produce a control strategy for the batch pen? Uh, yes. So the, the, the batch pen automation, um, what we mean like that in, in BMA is um, that uh, it will be controlled completely in a control room and not in the factory. So that is the difference between batch pen automation and uh, normal batch pen usage where you have uh, all the people, all the, the workers in the uh, like be beside the, the the batch pan, using it and uh, and doing it manually. What we do is we have uh, everything is automated. The automatic automatic valves, uh, the stirrer, uh, the bricks measurement. Everything is done uh, automatic and not manually. Yep. Okay, there are some uh, quite similar questions. And I guess this one is from Mr. Pobi from Indonesia. Kind regards to you. So um, the combination of this cooling crystal system together with a VKT, what is the expected CV? Do we have any actual figures on that? Uh, yes, we have some figures. Um, we, I don't have it right now, but uh, we have, I think, uh, I think we have CVs around 25 uh, for the VKT uh, okay. for A or refinery, but uh, this can be sent uh, in the comments afterwards uh, with the real values because I don't have them with me right now. Yeah, I think they can simply send it to the sales at bma-de.com email address and then we can give you some more details about those figures. Yes. And there's one question related to the slurry. So what do you think is the best chemical to make slurry or what is BMA using? We use um, isopropanol. And um, that's what we use normally. We don't, uh, we have not used any other chemicals. Okay. So I think for today, we have still a lot of questions and they are coming up some few more, but uh, due to the time, I would like to ask you to keep on asking questions. We will answer them afterwards and also add them all to our presentation, which will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So once again, thank you so much, Hans, for joining us today. It was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, hear about this thank presentation. You, and yeah, guys, so please stay tuned, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we will see each other in our next webinar, which is coming in the next few weeks or months. And stay tuned. And Hans, see you the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.